So the first thing I'm going to do, or we're going to do, is I'm going to spring a pop quiz on you. Both readings are coming from a book called Ho Ka Millennium. That was the first chapter. It's a real nice overview book uh, that gives the general public an idea of who the Ho Kam were as of 2007. So the first thing, and this is more just a gauge to figure out not only did you read, but also what do you know about Ho Kam, which is most, most of the time you don't, people don't know that much about the Ho Kam. I didn't know about the Ho Kam until I really got into archaeology. So the first question is, the Hokan built the most massive canals where? You can give the continent, but more so it specifically says a country. The Hokan heartland is larger than what U.S. state? What are the two types of monumental architecture the Hokan built? What is one trade item that the Hokan got through their connections to Mesoamerica? And then which of the following is not is not a hallmark of Hokam culture before um, 1100 CE. So I don't know if you talked about the dating types. You have AD and BC versus um, BCE versus CE. It's still in the literature, it's B BC and AD, but uh, there's been a push to do CE instead of AD. Uh, so which one of those is not a hallmark? Is it ball courts before 1150? Is it ball courts, adobe rooms inside walled compounds, right on buff pottery, or pallets? So for the first question, the Hokan built the most massive canals where? So the answer has been uh, Phoenix, Salt River Valley, and Arizona. So more importantly, the Hokan built the most massive pre-industrial ancient canals north of Peru. And it's probably one of the largest irrigation systems in the world. Peru has more irrigation there, canals, but no individual system is really bigger than the Hokan's individual systems. So you're looking at irrigation at a massive scale, a scale that's not going to be rivaled until really SR, Salt River Project starts doing stuff in the 1900s. They start before then, but the entire, re or a strong reason that Euro-Americans are here is because of Hocom Canals. Because they just, the Euro-Americans, Jack Swilling and some others, just dug out previously used canals and lay the foundation of Phoenix. That's where the name comes from, that there was a, a new civilization that was riding, rising out of the ashes of an old civilization. The Hocom Heartland is larger than what U.S. state? South Carolina, good. So it gives you a, a rough idea of how large, and I'll show on the next, next slide, I believe, uh, how the extent, because we're not talking, there was no international border. The Hocom boundaries go all the way down into Mexico. So you're going from essentially the, et, like where Cave Creek, Queen, uh, not Queen Creek, but Cave Creek, Anthem is, the, the town of Anthem is, all the way down to into Mexico. That's north and south. East and west is Gila Bend to like Superstition Mountains. So you're looking at a massive amount of square mileage that were the main parts of the Hocom core or Hocom area. What are the two types of monumental architecture the Hocom built? So the two types are platform mounds, and ball courts. And as I'll discuss, you don't want to get those confused. Ball courts are first, they go out of use, and then the platform mounds come. There's some earlier platform mounds that I'll discuss, but platform mounds like Pueblo Grande and Mesa Grande that you see today, that doesn't come around until around 1300, 80, 1300 CE. Uh, 1300 CE. Um, unlike Mesoamerica, and as I'll show with the ball courts, our ball, the Hokan ball courts are completely different from Mesoamerican ball courts. There are no I-shaped ball courts, or really alley-shaped ball courts among the Hokan, and there are no oval ball courts among Mesoamerica, except for really, really early. Uh, se several thousand years before the cultures you know of in Mesoamerica. When the Spanish came, or Spaniards came, uh, there were multiple different types of games, and they, play, they continue to play games down up in northern Mexico. The, uh, the more common game, it's about, the ball's about that big. Um, it's made out of wire, well, 
the balls that we found are made out of lioli, which is a bush that grows in the Chihuahuan Desert. It's a rubber-like substance. But they, during World War II, they wanted to use it as a substitute for um, rubber trees because rubber trees were in the area where the Japanese were. Um, they, they found out that you couldn't do it at a m massive scale, but it, w it was thought that it might have been. But the balls now, the, for ball games, they're oftentimes made out of wildly if they're natural. What, what is one trade item that the Hohokam got through their connections to Mesoamerica? Cacao has not really been found in Hohokam. I don't know of any examples. Cacao is more of getting into Chaco Canyon. It's uh, Casas Grandes or Pacame, which is in Chihuahua, up into uh, the ancestral Pueblo and our members' world. Um, I just don't, I don't. There's, it may be a black drink. That's also her thing. Um, as far as I know, she, she, I haven't seen anything definitive about chocolate being among the Hocom. It, if it, it's nothing that's compared to what's at Choco Canyon, if it, if it was here. Um, Choco Canyon and the Hocom are very, very different in what they care about uh, from what we can see in the archaeological record. That's another thing. So cacao was one suggestion. We don't really have evidence of that or don't have strong evidence. What's another thing? Shells is correct, but shells are interesting, and I'll get to the shells, because they are coming from uh, the Baja, so the Gulf of California. Originally, they're coming from the Pacific, and then they come from the Gulf of California. Um, but they, they ultimately become very ho-calm to the extent, the extent that when archaeologists have found shell jewelry within the archaeological record, they oftentimes attribute it to Hohokam craftsmen or, or craftspeople. Um, so it's, sir, shell trumpets, yes, those are definitely uh, from Mesoamerican, but shell, jewelry, shell and that's used is kind of an in-between thing. Th there's two dominant theories. One is you have trading parties, uh, Hohokam trading parties that are going down. There's particular sites like Shell Town, imagine that, it's called Shell Town, it has a lot of shell. Um, you have shell, cha shell Town and a few other places that have a, a massive amount of shell um, that they may have been going down there. Everybody has some shell and that kind of decreases over time. Uh, otherwise, it's down the line trading. But the real interesting part is that after AD 1000 or 1100, the Hokan become very isolated, and I'll talk about that next week. Um, they start, stop trading with everybody, it looks like. Unlike uh, the ancestral Pueblo and world of the members side, they just become very about themselves, based off the archaeological record that we can see. Why do you think that there's three pieces of Pachuca obsidian from the base of Mexico, where Mexico City is now? That's where the source is. When the Spanish were doing the Entrada into the southwest, they, there's only a few Spaniards that were actually conquistadors. Otherwise, they were using local people that they were able to t first have them battle against the Aztec or the Mexica because most people didn't like the Mexica. And the, the Spanish kind of fit into the system that the Aztecs had been fit into previously from the Toltecs and on through time. Uh, so it was more than likely people f that were may have been Mexica or Aztec had come up into the southwest with the Spaniards as they went trudging north trying to expand their territories. So it's actually historic rather than prehistoric. It changes over time. The Hohokam, there's a little bit of obsidian used very, very early in time before the, the Ho, what I call the Hohokam cultural sequence, and I'll get to why I call it that. Um, and then during the pre-classic, so around 8300, it really falls off, and they're not using it at all. You have abundant, really fine-grained basalts that are washing down the Salt River, and the Gila, they can get, they have sources. Um, and so, you don't see it picking back up until around AD 1100. And so the sources start out kind of everywhere. You get some from Government Mountain, which is the San Francisco Peaks and, uh, and Flagstaff. There's a little bit that comes from the Vulture Mine out in West Phoenix. Um, Salcedo is toward Mexico. So they're kind of all coming from different spots. The interesting part is the most widely dis distributed obsidian source is Mule Creek, which is right on the border of New Mexico and Arizona. It's where I did my field school. 
we don't get Mule Creek really here. There's a few pieces. It's really small stuff. It's like this. It's a really o old source because obsidian doesn't stay obsidian forever. It becomes perlite. It breaks down into these little needles. So if you go in New Mexico, they have a rock hounding law, that's what it's called, where you can collect 90, 99 pieces um, plus one piece. Or is it? It's 99 pounds a piece? No, it's 99 pieces plus, no, it's 99 pounds of pieces plus one piece. Uh, sorry. There's no limit on what that one piece weighs. So if you get a boulder that has a bunch of gold in it, that's fair game within New Mexico. Um, so people go out and they collect these sources, which is impacted the sources, and that's going to be a real theme among uh, archaeological sites is the destruction that has happened for people not meaning to, destruct, to cause damage to sites because people like arrowhead hunting um, or digging around like uh, the shooting gallery at Mesa Grande, the, the Mormon family was digging around in there and the tunnel collapsed. So that, that type of thing was common. So people like going out to um, different sources and Angela Garcia talked about how the best tur turquoise soy source is now owned by the Tiffany Company. Um, so you can go to these different sources and you can go to the Mule Creek source and it's, I went there and when I picked up a piece of obsidian, um, my hand came up with a bunch of needles on it. They're little gray needles because that's a perlite. Um, so it's coming from all over. Um, you can use something called uh, XRF. And then what it stands for is slipping my mind right now. Actually, fluorescence, thank you. It uses a laser. It's, it, comes in, it comes in a gun. That's, it's called a gun. And you, you blast it with a laser. And the uh, electrons that come off and the elements that come off tell you what the signature is. What's really great about obsidian is every source or every volcano is different and every volcanic eruption is different. So you can figure out exactly where a source comes from. And they've done that throughout the Southwest. Steve Shackley is his name, or Stephen Shackley. And so you can figure out exchange networks and who is interacting with who just by where certain things are. And we know that there's a shift over time here that they stop, the HOCOM here stop uh, accepting or taking government mountain or uh, flagstaff obsidian and going all south. So back on track for the questions. Your comment about the macaws, yes. They're very big in the Mesoamerica, or not Mesoamerica, Mesoamerica yes. Um, they're very big in the Membrus world and Chaco Canyon side and at Casas Grandes. Not so much here. You find effigy vessels, but they're few and far between, and there's very few burials. There's maybe a handful of macaw burials. Whereas at, at Chaco Canyon, they found a room that was full of macaws are about a year old, deep within Chaco, or Pueblo Benito. They all seem to have died, kill, been killed around the age of one year of yearling. So th there's, uh, there's questions about were they actually coming up there alive, were they dead? Because I have a friend that uh, looks at macaw trade uh, within the Membris and down in Casas Grandes, and he's met with macaw trainers who are still around. Um, they have the same volume as a chainsaw, and they can ba basically bite through anything. So they're really na nasty birds, but they talk. And so that's what, what people think why the Membrinos and people at Chaco Canyon and people at Casas Grandes, we have pens. There's tens of pens down at Casas Grandes or Pacame where they're actually raising them. And we have eggshells and other things. But for whatever reason, they don't, the Hocom didn't find affinity with them, or there wasn't a, a connection with the macaws here that there was in New Mexico. Another thing is copper bells. Copper bells were originally from down in South America. Then they started being smelted along the west coast of Mexico. Uh, the Sinaloa, I can never say that, Sinaloa area. Yes, thank you. So West Mexico, and we didn't have smelting here. We only have one really good example of a pottery production area down at Snake Town. I'll talk about, um, but they were not smelting here. 
If you ever read into the literature of the HOCOM, you'll see references to slag or smelting. It didn't happen here. It's a byproduct of agave roasting or other roasting or pottery production. But we do have natural copper and other things here, but they just weren't doing it. Uh, and mosaic mirrors. So they're sh briefly, they're, sand they're oftentimes a sandstone back, they're round, and they're made out of pyrite. Little pyrite pieces are f fitted together into a mosaic that you can kind of see yourself in them. Um, there's a whole ideology behind what mirrors are in Mesoamerica, but I'm just not going to go into it right now because it doesn't factor into what you need to know. But I was keeping you abreast of that. Um, and then finally, which of the following is not a hallmark of Hokom culture before 1100 CE? Good. Yes, it is B. Adobe rooms and sidewall compounds. That occurred during the later part of the classic period. And I'll get to the architectural sequence that happens. So it doesn't surprise me um, that people just don't know that essentially the Phoenix Basin or the Phoenix metropolitan area is here it's sitting on the foundation of the Hocom. And their descendants are still here. So as I was saying, the maximum distribution of the Hocom interaction sphere dates to the sedentary period. That's the widest. There's going to be a crunch that happens where people start coming back toward the core. So the core of the Hocom area is the Phoenix Basin. It's, often, it's also known as the Gila Basin sometimes in the literature. So the Phoenix Basin here, you can see Pueblo Grande, La Ciudad, Las Clinas. Pueblo Grande is near the airport. Uh, La Ciudad is at St. Luke's Hospital. It's, it's around there. And then uh, Las Clinas is more or less the I-10 and 17 um, in, in that area. Going all the way down into the Tucson Basin. So you have Marana, which is a major site. Um, of sorts, Tucson, and then you're going all the way down into here. The, this portion right here is known as Papagoria, and they have some traits that are Hokom-ish, but it's a really tough place to live, and that's something that Angela had brought up, that when you get into the western deserts, water becomes so precious that um, not a lot of people lived out there. Mo more people lived along the Colorado River than they did out in the deserts. But there were a number of people out there, um, more than you would think. It encompassed roughly 65,000 square kilometers, which is 40,000 square miles in area. So it goes all the way from the Verde Valley. So here's the Verde River. So yeah, it's this entire area. Changes over time. It starts smaller, really extends out, and kind of contracts back. There's gonna be, there is a difference between the Tucson Basin in the Phoenix Basin that I just really can't get into. Um, my expertise is in the Phoenix Basin. I know of the T Tucson Basin. They make a red on brown pottery instead of a red on buff. And based off the data that we have, it looks like they kind of, they were participating in the HOCOM system, but they were kind of doing their own thing. Um, that you get red on buff pottery going all the way down into Mexico but the red on brown pottery doesn't really go that far out of the Tucson Basin, out of the real core. And we do get later red on brown pottery. After th so there's a type that's called tanky verde red on brown that was said to be only produced until AD 1300. Based off of research I've done and other people have done, it's been found that it's actually produced outside Tucson Basin after 1300. Um, I have a suspicion that it might be part of a um, cultural transition that happens at the end called the Polverone phase that I'll talk about next week. So I, ch I say it's a Hokom cultural sequence, and there's debate whether this is Hokom or not. I say cultural, the Hokom cultural sequence because it's the same people. It'd be like you saying people that were here during pre before the Revolutionary War were not the same as their descendants that are here now. Same thing. So, and that's, that's a big thing that the Otham talk about, that they're still there, they're still the descendants of people that came before. So kind of showing that is the Hokom is a cultural, or is a, uh, an archeological culture, but the people themselves, they have a much longer duration or durée 
Long Duray in uh, the Southwest. So oftentimes this is called the pre ho calm. So the Red Mountain phase or Vaki phase, which starts around 81-ish, maybe 50 BC, and it lasts until 8500. The real important part is, beginning with material culture, it's the beginnings of pottery production. You get much older pottery production in Mexico, in the basin of Mexico, but they start making their own pots around 8300-ish, um, 200. As I'll talk about after that, you start getting decorated pottery. This right here, Vaki Red, is one of the hallmarks of the Vaki phase. The real interesting thing is they were making a lot of this Vaki Red, which is very distinct, and then for whatever reason, the Hocom or the pre-Hocom, um, they stop making redware pottery. It all becomes plainware or it becomes decorated wares. Uh, red on gray and then red on buff. So, and that's gonna last for over a thousand years or so. So multi-generational and they're gonna pick it up for whatever reason. So if, if you feel so inclined, you can look into this. Maybe you will be the one that solves the mystery of why they stop producing red on wear, or red wear pottery. And it's red wear pottery, pottery because it slipped. So a slip is a thin, watery clay. It's oftentimes mixed with a binder, uh, possibly animal fat or some other kind of, something that's gonna make it stick to the pots themselves. And then it's, it's fired, um, it's put into a fire and it's heated up to above uh, 600 degrees Celsius, which is whatever Fahrenheit. Um, you start toward the vitrification um, heat. Um, we never get really high fire stuff except for late in time for something called Jedido yellowware or uh, Wallaby yellowware. And that's coming from the, the Hopi Mesas and that's after 1300. They start actually using coal in the pottery production. We don't have anything like that here. So it's, it's usually a low fire. And if the pottery that we're gonna find is not gonna be this. this is, we're, the site that we're at is much later than this. But it kind of gives you an idea of um, the type of firing conditions that's going on. This is called oxidized. You have a, a um, aerobic or a, a um, non-oxidized environment where there's no oxygen coming in and you get a whiteware type of environment versus an oxidized environment which uh, causes the pots to turn red. Essentially the pots are rusting. That's what it, the clays have a lot of iron in them and they turn red. At this time, people start, start living in the same place permanently. You see a little bit of uh, permanent sedentism uh, during the archaic, which is previous to this. But for the most part, people are living in one spot for six months and they're living in another spot during six months. Reason being, or oftentimes the reason that's thought is as people are starting to pick up agriculture. That here you need to tend canals, and I'll talk about canals in a few slides. That you need to be there to take care of your fields. You can leave at certain points, but the growing season here is so long that you essentially just need to be here. So yeah, you start getting aggregations into larger settlements. That really bad image is of a Red Mountain uh, pit house. So it's not much, it's kind of, it's a pit as it implies. And then there's a bunch of poles and then there's adobe or other material put over it. It's kind of a wattle and daub type of superstructure. We're not getting truly what you see during villages, which is formal cemeteries, formal trash mounds, but people are starting to living together. They're starting to uh, build the base of what the Hohokam will be living like later in time. So did the Hohokam have a sipapu? Not that we know of. I mean, there might be some instances with the platform mounds, but in general, it's not, you see it in ancestral Puebloan in the New Mexico area but you don't really see it here. Um, the Subapu is, has to do with the Tree of Life, or the Axis Moon Day, that the Subapu is where ancestral Puebloan, the Hopi now, that they believe that they, are, they came out of the ground from the underworld, 
Um, and the sleep of poo is where it happened. And so they replicate that in kivas and other things through time. But I, I really don't, it doesn't seem to be a strong thing that happened here. The mortuary practices at this time, this is a, a drawing from Tucson. You're getting flexed inhumations and supine, so on, on their back inhumations. I'm not sh quite sure why this individual um, has her legs kind of back. Their tip, the inhumations that I'm familiar with, they're laid out uh, flat, so the legs are straight out. They don't have pottery for the most, you're starting to get pottery and you're getting some, but you're still getting the, the point where they're not really putting pots in. Um, you get some ground stone put in, and the assumption is that if you're, if you're getting ground stone with an individual, it may be female, um, because ethnographically, females are oftentimes associated with grinding and the pro processing of food. Also at this time, you're getting, uh, large stones or even matates, which are the, the grinding part. Monos are the hand stone and matates are what's ground against. You're getting matates put on top of burials, kind of like a, a, not a crypt, you do get crypts, but they're later in time. But they're, they're lining the top of the burials. They, they occasionally happen. So as I'll talk about for the beginnings of the pioneer period, um, there's gonna be a shift uh, inhumations never go away. The, the Hocom will continue to do in, inhumations, but the more common style of mortuary practice is going to be cremations during the pre-classic. I'll get to why people think that they stop doing cremations or it becomes, it decreases, but why they started doing cremations, it's, it's an ideological thing that it's very hard to get at archaeologically. You can look within the, the ethnographic, but the Otham were uh, burying their dead. They weren't really cremating, but uh, historically, or proto-historically. So we don't have a real good analog here in the Southwest. And even ancestral Puebloan and, and Puebloan people, they bury their people, uh, their ancestors. What you see across the world is you get really finely made tools. So if you think about Folsom or uh, really finely made Clovis points, they're big, the hunter gatherers are going out and supposedly killing woolly mammoths and other things. But once agriculture starts in an area, it, it's not about the time. I mean, you have agriculture starting much earlier in like China and uh, Europe, or the Levant area. Uh, Shortly after that, you see a, people start transitioning to expedient tools. That they're just picking up tools because you're not moving around much because you're growing crops. And so it's, it's something that you see uh, pan globally. That once agriculture starts, you see a transition away from a, a really intense use of formal tools. You still get tools, like in Mesoamerica, you have bladelets that are really long that the, the Aztecs and people before them made, but it's a really specialized skill. So there's, there seems to be certain things that humans just kind of do. Ceremonialism during the Red Mountain phase and Baki phase revolves around two things. It's, very, it's, an, it's oftentimes identified as a very individualistic ceremonialism or ritualism. One part that is more bringing people together are these large houses or meeting halls with, with the red arrow pointing to it. So they're much larger pit houses. And so because they're mu much larger and they don't really have the same features that you expect if it was just a single family, that it may have been the, a paramount person, important person, the head of a group that was living there that would also entertain and do other things within the house. So that's one part of the ritual that's going on or has been supposed to be going on. The other part is figurines. Figurines are not going to last that long into the pre-classic. They do it, but there's going to be a shift that happens through time toward more of a collective, having a collective identity. First as an overall arching, we are whatever, not the Hocom, they didn't call themselves that. Um, we are blah, 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 um, which is a common thing. Uh, at the re regional le level, and then you're going to see it much tighter within irrigation systems and the villages themselves. But the interesting thing about the figurines is they're not standardized. 
I mean, they don't have molds like you do in Mesoamerica. Um, but they, kind of, they show a range of life things. You see little tiny figurines that may be children. You have pregnant, ones that look pregnant. Um, and so it's been thought that figurines are part of life and death ceremonies, births, um, fertility for crops. So it's kind of a wide gamut. It's happening at the household level. So for right now, before you get really into the Ho'okam cultural sequence, people are, are kind of doing things together ceremonially, but they're also doing stuff very individualistically. They're thought to be used in rejuvenation ceremonies, some kind of ceremony. Um, what they actually mean, it's hard to elicit it, that from their, the figurines themselves because we don't have paintings, we don't have really anything. To, like it's not Tlaloc type of thing where you can actually, you can see the goggle-eyed deity. These are just, they're, sta they're, they're standardized. They have a coffee bean eye, which is oftentimes associated with Ho'okam, even though they, they you just find them in West Mexico. But yeah, they, they don't, see, we don't see a, a Venus type of reputation. So for subsistence, people continue to do hunting and gathering, like I said, and get, it's more, much more gathering, but there was a really huge middle archaic site several thousand years before this found at Luke Air Force Base, they found several years ago, that it was always thought that people were really moving around at that time, but there's actually pit houses and other things there, that they were le at least living in that area seasonally. There's not really good water there now, but apparently there was back then. But people are starting to live in places more, like I said, more constantly, and so they're still doing hunting, hunting and gathering a little bit, but they're starting to make canals in order to grow corn or maize, beans and squash, uh, the three sisters as it's sometimes called. My question to you is, what is maize? What type of plant is it? It is a starch, but is it a tree? Is it a bush? It's a grass. Where, where did it originally grow? Yeah, it's, it's a tropical grass. The, the origin of maize is teosinte. They're little thi tiny things. You look at a teosinte pl plant, and you compare it to the monstrosity that we have now, it's night, night and day. I have a, I have a thing about uh, GMOs, because GMOs have been around forever. So in order to actually grow Maize, there's, it's thought that there was a first wave of maize that occurred much earlier than this that didn't really stick, it wasn't that good. But around 4000 BC or 2000 BC, you start seeing a really hardy type of maize that spreads first into Tucson Basin, then up into Phoenix Basin, and then much later up into the Colorado Plateau. So the question is, was the maize traded in or did the people actually go down there and get it from the original source? They're, they're trying to figure out what, where it's coming from. There's theories that have been put out that it may have been a Mesoamerican, this is all pre-Mesoamerica, but they call it the Mesoamerican package, that it, it kind of came up that people just brought it up here. The important thing is you have to know how to grow maize. And so that's why people have always thought that it may have been people from Mesoamerica that kind of went, interacted with people toward the Southwest and then those people kind of taught people, and so it was a down the, the line pr progression. A much older one is there actually were people from Mesoamerica that were living up here, um, and then they integrated into the society with their corn. There's been studies to find out if it's diffusion, which is if it's moving up north or people are coming with it, but there, there's evidence for both. We know less about the beans and squash. We know that was growing here, but the focus of study has always been really the corner maze. This black line right here, this is a Red Mountain phase canal. So it's very, very small. The canal is probably like that big. It's not really big and it's not, they're not really, I wouldn't be surprised if it wasn't a natural channel that they just kind of manipulated. That's a very common human thing is humans will manipulate natural channels. So it's not very big, but the important thing is you're getting the need to have households work together. So this may have been a, only a, a family, so a household is 
within the Southwest, it's typically four people. It's thought to be four people. That's based off an et the ethnographic record. Um, then you have extended household, which are more people. You have parents and their, their children. And so after a while, you, you live in these larger villages and you, or larger settlements, and you need much larger canals. So you're, depend you're depending not only on the people that are within your settlement as you're moving or you're living further and further away from the river, you're also depending on people up canal from you. So it's, it's causing an increasing dependency uh, on social connections. And there was a thought that, it's a strong thought that some people still hold on to, that there had to be elites controlling this. My study of elites are they don't like to be bothered. That they want things, but the fact, if they have to go out and make you give it to them, they don't like doing that. That's when you have armies go out and destroy things in order to get it. But you never see um, rulers going out themselves and actually going out to irrigators and saying, give, give me your crops. It's always soldiers and other people that do it. Um, we don't have that type of thing here. We're, I'm going to talk about the more, we, are, we do get social complexity, but we don't get these royal elites. The elites that we get are important people that have important knowledge. So all the foundation of that are these type of canals that are really small. So moving into the pioneer period, this is around 8500, you start getting pottery production. So there's three phases that are associated with it. You have the Australia phase, you have the Sweetwater phase, and you have the Snake Town phase. And they have different attributes to them, and I'll talk about that in a second. So from here on out, the periods, except for the sedentary period, which I'll talk about in a little bit, they have multiple phases to them. And the phases oftentimes are linked to the pottery, the type of pottery that's produ produced, the, the style. So with Australia red on gray, which it's oftentimes brown, it's a, it's a reddish brown, but they call it gray because the later stuff is gray. You get this chevron type of pattern. It's, it's very, very thick. After this point, you get much thinner lines. And you can see that there's experimentation, that people are learning how to, to produce decorated pottery, and they they become masters pretty quickly at doing it. So by the time, it's around AD 750, you see this transition from a red on brown pottery to a red on buff pottery. So if iron oxidizes and turns a pot red, how do you stop, or how do you think you make a, a buff clay? So you, you put it into a reduced atmosphere. They didn't, ha they didn't really do re reduced atmospheres here, but it, there's more to it. The clay does have less iron. So this is going to get, this is very, very important of where red on buff pottery or red on gray pottery is being produced. So not to drag this out too much, it's cliche. Has anybody dealt with digging a pool here and how, how much it costs or really digging a hole here? It's concrete. It's essentially, it's uh, carbon or calcium carbonate. And it's a, it's a precipitate that just because it's so dry here, it's a calcium that this forms in the soils. The really interesting thing about caliche is when it's processed into little tiny nodules, it reduces the ability for iron to oxidize. You can't have a bunch of it. If you have a bunch of iron in your clay, it's still going to turn brown. There's something called a brown paste variant that's made later in time that's made up here. That's a, that's a mimic of things made along the, the middle Gila. So that's preluding into we more or less know where red on buff pottery was, or red on gray and then red on buff pottery was being produced. It was being produced all along the middle Gila. This pottery is going out to the entire 40,000 square miles. So you have one area. These are not full-time specialists. They're, they're part-time specialists. So they are really, they're skilled at making pots, but they're not doing it all the time. First and foremost, they're farmers. And they do other things. A skilled craftsperson can put together, can make a pot like the Snake Town run on buff, maybe an hour. It's, they're, it's quick. When this really skilled workers, the, the people that know how to do it, can put together a pot really quickly. And it can be really ornate too. So that's going to get into the exchange system that I'll get into shortly. But doing tests and figuring out that it, all, it's, it takes 
a certain type of clay and it takes caliche a certain amount to produce a buff where shows that there's a major technological advancement that happens around AD 750 that the Hocom learned how to make buffware pottery because it, it's extremely hard to do. A major production site is Snake Town. So the production area is, if, as you're driving from here to Tucson, as you cross the, Salt, the Gila River, where Gila Butte is, that is uh, the middle Gila, and that's where the pottery is coming from. All the red on buff pottery, any red on buff pottery we find here was produced down there. So the pit houses continue. This is an illustration of some pit houses over here. So there's two types of pit structures. The correct term is pit structure. You have a pit house, which the structure, the bottom of the structure wall is the top of the pit. Then you have a house and pit, where you have the house is, you, you dig the pit, and then you build your house out of the pit, and the pit walls are not part of the structure walls. So you can actually see that you'll get tr troughs that are made on house and pits versus the post holes that align along the edge of a pit, if it's a pit, true pit house. And there is some variation through time. You start getting formalized uh, settlement structures. You get courtyard groups. So you have one pit house here, you have another pit house here, and they all face toward a common courtyard. So it's called a courtyard group. You get super positioning, where one house is built on another house, built, not, built on another house. Any ideas why you think they would be super positioning? So it could be people that are there and they're rebuilding their house. It could be changing styles, um, changing village style. There, it doesn't seem that the pit houses themselves change that much, the style of them change that much. They all kind of, based off of what we know archeologically, they kind of look the same. There is, there is changes with a floor plan, but you're more on the right track with the same owner. Rather than being the same owner, it's the same family. So your grandparents are this lowest house. Then your parents, in order to maintain their land hold, holdings and maintain a place where they grew up and have a uh, connection to the ancestors, they build their house on top of their parents' house. And then for the same reason, you build your house on top of their house. And so you get these layers that has to do with land tenure, has to do with ancestor, um, not veneration, but calling back to your, dis, your ancestors. Uh, an ancestor lines of connections are very important ethnographically, that they give legitimacy for people being in power or ha having certain knowledge. Because if your grandparents knew that ceremony, you're allowed to do that ceremony. Um, but if you're a newcomer, you're not allowed to do that ceremony. Yeah, so did it become because of erosion or did it become because of belief system? Uh, all of it. I mean, it, it, we can tell a lot in the archaeological record, but after that you start speculating. And so this gets into the area of speculation. You can, you can look at the ethnographic record, and they kind of were living in pit houses when the Spaniards came but they're not the same type. They're, they're a, they, they were different shapes and they're a different type. Um, they're kind of a hybrid in between a, a pit house and a classic period compound. You don't get these, this type of structure in smaller sites like a farmstead. So a farmstead is a, usually a single uh, ephemeral or not long lasting pit house or pit structure. And so you'll get a pit and maybe another one and they won't really face toward each other into a courtyard. But when you get into a farmstead, you start getting, you'll have a storage pit house here, and then, or pit structure, and then you'll have where people are living, and you kind of get burials. And by the time you start getting into hamlets, which are bigger, they're multi-household, people are built, uh, burying their deads in certain cemeteries, and you get trash mounds. The other thing about pit houses is they're open. And around the world, people hate staying indoors unless they have to because it's smoky but there's also stuff that lives in there and I found uh, mud dauber nests and ha mud daubers are wasps so you're gonna have scorpions snakes and other things living in your house and so it's actually really common to find how pit houses burned down 
there's a site from up north that something like 75% of the pit houses were burned down. It wasn't warfare, it wasn't done at one time. It was done over time that there is beliefs that if somebody dies, you leave everything there and possibly burn down the house. Part of the ritual. So essentially, it's also a cleaning measure measure that you can, you get rid of the, the things that are kind of bugging you. I guess literally they would be bugging you if they're bugs. But you can rebuild and start anew. So briefly, you get a transition into cremations. You're still getting inhumations during the uh, Pioneer. This example is, these are from the same report. And so this is showing a test. This is experimental archaeology. I b believe this is a pig that they use as an analog. And so they build up a bunch of brush, and they just let it burn. Because they wanted to know, if you have a primary cremation, primary means it was not moved from the context it burned in for cremations. For wherever it was deposited, wherever it's put, primary means it's there. Oftentimes in archaeology, we're working in a secondary context. We want primary context, and that's how we make an archaeological uh, assumption and archaeological theories and hypotheses. But the fact of the matter is, you will be going dealing with secondary context more than you'd like, because people that dig around. It will probably be dealing with secondary context out at the cemetery. So the question being, how would how they treat the cremations uh, once the individual was burned and the fire was out? Would they just leave it there? Would they collect up the remains and put it into pots? Uh, kind of all of it. Um, you, I'm not, I know there's primary cremations in the Hocom area. Um, they're less common. More commonly, you find secondary cremations where they will have cremated the individual and then they put it into one or more pot, the remains into one or more pots. Um, oftentimes, you find projectile points jewelry and other things that have gone through the fire. So you'll get a projectile point that was like this before it went in, and then it's curved after it's gone through the fire because it's an extremely hot fire in order to um, cremate somebody. So you're, you're, it's not a true cremation because there are, it's a low fired cremation. You just can't get to the temperatures you would need to to get a, a true cremation. So there's actually a lot of skeletal material that's left, enough so that um, Bioarchaeologists are able to identify possibly the age or, or the sex of the individual, um, even though they've been incinerated. So that's, re that's really important for understanding um, age uh, dynamics during the pre-classic and sex dynamics during the pre-classic. Yeah, so the question being, what is, what is the mindset that happened to cause a change from inhumations to cremating people? Yes, there is a belief around the world that inhumations are part of the death process and the journey to the afterlife process. The interesting thing about cremations is I'm not as familiar with how that fits into um, afterlife beliefs, but I know that there are certain groups that burn food and they burn offerings to the ancestor. So I could foresee something like in order to get the person into the afterlife, they have to be sent up in smoke. And so they, they're transported, they're, they're transitioned into a different form, and they're sent off into the afterlife. That's, that's a speculative guess of what's going on. Cremations could be a part of a dust-to-dust -dust process. I mean, typically they're put into vessels, and the vessels are pretty rigid, and so they, they keep it. But I could see breaking down, making the body into a different form. So for ceremonialism, the large, uh, meeting halls continue, but the important part of this, so we don't know what's really going on for ceremonial at, ceremonially at this time, as I'll talk about next week. Uh, we don't really know what's going on ceremonially between the pre-classic and classic. It's a time period that we, that's called the pre-classic classic transition. That you, they stopped, Hocom apparently stopped using ball courts and they haven't start started using the formalized platform mounds that they use after 1300. They're doing something. I have a, I've looked into this and it's probably plazas. But another part of this is platform mounds. Even though it's not the formalized rectangular platform mounds that Pueblo Grande or Mesa Grande is, you start getting these amorphous 
blobby, not a blobby, but amorphous mounds that originally may have been trash mounds. So unlike the ancestral Puebloans or other places, we don't have middens for the most part. Um, we have, the Hohokam had trash mounds, so they, they would bring all the refuge and the refuge would build up over time, and so you have a, a mound. And so I thought that this at mound 16 at Snake Town, that it may have been a cliche capped trash mound that may have been used for dancing. So you get, it's, it's a platform. The other interesting thing is you may not be able to see it, but there are cuts. So during the excavation, they didn't just ex excavate through the mound um, and take it away. They also didn't just stop when they got to this lair. They wanted to know what is the developmental sequence of this mound. And something that we see through all the platform mounds, it changes over time. So each one of these little cuts is a proceedingly younger version of the platform mound. And so they're changing over time. They're changing shapes. The later mounds are changing structures. So the structures that are on top of them, that are eventually on top of them. You're going to have a, com a wall that surrounds it that changes over time. And so we know that they change. What that means for the things that are going on top of it, there's been speculations about that, and I'll get to that. So do we know the dating of the different stages of the mount uh, construction? Yes and no. So I, I, I reference Mesoamerica, so people mostly know Meso Mesoamerica pretty well, like Mexico. And the temples there are a good uh, approximate for what's going on here. They're, they're not the same, but you see some similarities. Uh, unlike the Mesoamerican, the Toltec, and then the Aztec temples, every developmental series does not have a different pottery type. The secret of Hokam dating is it is based off of tree rings elsewhere. And it's when a certain pottery type appears where they have tree rings. So we say that Snake Town right on Buff goes from 750, 80, 750 to 800. The reason being because in the, in the Puebloan area of Arizona, there was tree rings there. And based off the cut dates of those, the certain type of sherd, so the Snake Town Red and Buff was found. So there was a correlation made between the production of Snake Town Red on Buff and the use of Snake Town Red on Buff and the use of that room. The really interesting thing about Pueblos is even though Pueblos are huge and they can be 400, 600 rooms, they don't last very, or they're not used as residential structures very long. They're used maybe 25, 50 years. And so you're getting this continual cut sequence over time. And so from that tree ring uh, or the dendrochronological record, um, a lot of the southwestern pottery types are made. So also part of this, they did by this time, so this excavation was carried out in 1964, 1965. Before that, it was in the 1930s. Essentially, every platform mound that has ever been in, investigated or was here is either gone or is investigated before we had dating techniques to really pin down when things are happening. Because as I'll say, there's something like 40 platform mounds in the valley here, and there are now three. Two that you can go to. One is, I can't disclose. There, there's other ones uh, south of here, but in the valley. But we know that they're changing over time, and I'll get to it. Casa Grande, uh, compound B, has early platform mounds, and those change over time. And so there's a continual modification of the structure and possibly the ceremonialism that's associated with it. And then briefly, this is where we start getting large-scale irrigation during the pioneer period. This is M. L. Howery. He's called, considered the father of Hokam archaeology and Mogollon archaeology. Um, he was the head of the Department of Anthropology at University of Arizona. And so this is a much older canal, and this is a much younger canal, and so it gives you a good idea of how big these canals were. I've seen canals that are something like 15 feet by 20 feet. 
like where the Cubs stadium is, or the Cubs tra training stadium is now, there's a really huge canals there, or at least one. So these, these things are huge. This is a map that I created for my, for my work uh, showing the different canal systems. And so you're getting these really large multi-settlement canal systems. So all these little dots are working together to maintain this canal. So with that, I'll leave you in suspense till next week.